Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second installment of the SIAM ACDA online seminar series. We're glad to have you with us this morning, and we are especially delighted to welcome Monica Hinzinger from the University of Vienna. Monica is a professor of computer science and was formerly a director of research at Google, and her work is on graph algorithms with a recent focus on data structures and dynamic graph algorithms, which is what she will be speaking to us about this morning. We would ask that you hold your questions until the end when we'll have a Q&A session. Obviously, if something urgent comes up, feel free to send a message in the chat and I will interrupt Monica. All right, Monica, the stage is yours. Thank you for joining us. Great, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to talk about uh, recent advances in dynamic graph algorithms. So let me, uh, you know, get started with a nice quote. Uh, John F. Kennedy said, change is a law of life. And I feel like it's also a law of networks and the networks around us. So if you look at large real world graphs, then many of them are changing. For example, uh, street maps, right? You have traffic jams, um, you have uh, 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 roads becoming uh, unjammed again. Um, you have social networks that are growing and growing, as you see here, and you might add or remove links there. And the World Wide Web keeps on growing. For example, here is some data on the number of internet hosts in DNS. Uh, you see it kept on, uh, so this is, uh, I wanted to talk, if, I wanted to actually have a picture about the World Wide Web, but nobody knows how large the World Wide Web is. So instead I took the internet host in DNS as a proxy for it. And you see it kept on growing, but now it seems to be flattening somewhat. Um, many physical systems are actually dynamic. If you think of interactions of molecules, for example, there has also been a, a study by Sahu et al. on uh, real uh, on graphs that are used in practice, and they try to understand what kind of algorithmic problems have to be solved on these graphs. And they also ask, are they dynamic and are they large? And it turned out, out of 89 graphs, 55 were very large and also dynamic. So it's a real world problem uh, to come up with efficient algorithms in large uh, dynamic graphs. So now let me tell you about the model of dynamic graphs that are generally studied or have a lot of uh, research uh, activity currently. And let me then motivate it. Afterwards, I will talk about the state of the art for these algorithms. I will tell you about some upper bound techniques that have been very successful and about experimental evaluation. And finally, I will conclude with the future work. So you're all familiar with a static setting uh, where you have some computational problem and you're given some input that you give to your algorithm and it's supposed to produce some output. And what you're looking for is usually as performance measures the running time and the quality of the results if you cannot compute the exact answer all the time. But what about the following setting? Assume you have some first input and uh, you get some output. But then the input changes slightly, yeah, which is not so unusual, right? You say, oh no, this was actually a slight mistake or let me think about what if the input would have been like this. So you make a small change to your input and you get a second input version. And now you wanna get the output for the second input version. But then you said, oh no, there's again some small change. You get a third input. Now you wanna get the output for the third input. And so the dynamic question that we are asking is, if all these changes here are small, can you then compute the output faster than always rerunning the static algorithm from scratch? Okay, so this is the goal of the whole study of dynamic algorithms is, we wanna to try to come up with some way of storing information about the first execution of the algorithm so that the second execution is faster and then keep information about the second execution to make the third faster and so on and so forth. Okay, that's our goal. Now, specifically, what do we want? We really want a data structure, right? I just said, we wanna store information from the first run to the second run. What this means is we wanna have some kind of dynamic data structure that allows you to keep some information and for, for it has a current version of what it thinks is the input and then it should allow you to modify the input with an update operation. And it should allow you to get the output with a query operation. 
Okay, so you should be able to access the data and ask some query about the data, and it should be able to modify the input um, to get the new input that you want to have. You want to modify the current model of what your data is to uh, get the new input that you have. So basically, the sequence that I had before of operations where I just had input one, input two, and so on and so forth. Now, what we want to have is as follows. You have the input one, and then you ask the query one. It produces the output one. Then you do some update. You modify input one. And after this update operation, you actually have input two. And now you ask a query to that input two data, and you get output two. And then you modify input two, and now you have input three, and you ask some query to it, and you get output three. So really, the previous problem can be just formulated as a dynamic data structures problem. Dynamic data structure, because you can not just query the data, you can also modify the data that's stored in the data structure. And the question that we want to answer is, how fast can these updates and these queries be performed? In this talk, I will specifically talk about dynamic graph algorithms, even though one can also look at dynamic clustering algorithms and other things. So for dynamic graph algorithms, um, there are specific operations that people usually study. So the first operation that you have is you have some initial graph that is usually given to the data structure with the operation initialize, and that's only executed once. And it's also called the pre-processing step. And then you have update operations. They're usually edge insertions, edge deletions, um, these are the two update operations, and then queries. And the query depends on whether the query has no parameter, one, two, or more, depends on what type of problem you're trying to solve on the graph. Um, you can also think of, or you can ask the questions, what about node insertions and deletions? Um, yes, usually what we assume here is that you could insert or delete isolated nodes, but since that would be, and then do all the incident edges handle all the incident edges by inserting the edges each individually. Um, and the same thing when you delete a node, first you need to delete all its incident edges and then remove the node itself. Um, you can uh, even simpler, an even simpler model assumes that the number of nodes is actually given at the beginning and that the number of nodes never changes. And so usually we don't, in dynamic graph algorithms, we do not worry about node insertions and deletions, even though there has been some small subfield of publications that have studied node insertions and deletions, because in reality, it's a slightly different problem. And what I just said was a simplification of the setting. Okay, so for example, assume you wanna compute the shortest path. So here I live in Austria. So this is actually a graph, a picture of Austria. And I put a node in every big city of Austria and a, a black edge if there's a highway connection between these two cities, a direct highway connection. So for example, here is Vienna over here. This is where I am. So now you can also add some uh, weight to every edge, which would be the length of the highway between them. And now you can ask what's the shortest path from here. This would be uh, Linz to Graz from A to B. And um, now you can also ask from C to D. And now uh, assume something happens to the network. Um, a link, you have a traffic jam, a link disappears. Now you might ask again, what is the shortest path? And then you might want to insert an edge, magically a highway appears. And now you might again ask what's the shortest path. Okay, so this is, these are the operations that our data structure supports. Now you might ask, okay, how is this input actually generated? Because usually we have this worst case analysis, right? We assume there's some kind of worst case um, input. So now here, what is the equivalent in the dynamic setting to a worst case input? Well, we are assuming that the input is given by some adversary, okay? And there are two types of adversaries. One is the most powerful one is the adaptive adversary. It knows the algorithm, but if the algorithm is randomized, it does not know its random choices. And then it sees all the answers to the previous queries. And based on this information and unlimited computational power, it creates the next operation. And it has, of course, the goal to maximize the running time because it's a worst case adversary. And then there's a somewhat weaker adversary. It's called the oblivious adversary. Again, it knows the algorithm, but not its random choices. 
but it has to fix the sequence of operations before it receives any answers from the algorithm. And in this way, you're guaranteed that it cannot at all depend on the random choices. The queries that you get and the update operations that you get, both of them cannot depend on the random choices of the algorithm because the adversary had to think of writing them down before the algorithm even starts. And then based on this knowledge, again, it creates a sequence of operations with unlimited computational power and with the goal of maximizing the total running time. Now it's easy to argue that the running time that you get against an adaptive adversary is always larger equal than the running time against an oblivious adversary because the adaptive adversary can do exactly the same thing as the oblivious, can give you the same sequence as the oblivious. Now, how do we measure performance? Well, we usually look at the pre-processing time. Okay, usually for our algorithms, this is linear or a small polynomial in N. Then we look at the time per operations and um, for that, you, if you look at the update time, um, then we need to consider, um, actually both update and query time, we need to either look at the adaptive or the oblivious adversary, then we have either amortized or worst case time for operation, and then we have this trade-off between query and update time, uh, yeah, between query and update time. But as you can see, uh, with our uh, there's already a, a wide range for publications. There are already four types that you can publish, right? Adaptive, amortized, adaptive, worst case, oblivious, amortized, oblivious, worst case, right? So there's already uh, a blow up by a factor of four of the number of papers you can write on any specific problem just by looking at all possible combinations here. And now you can still have all kind of trade-offs between query and update time. Um, trivially, if you do nothing at query time and you just run a static algorithm at update time, you have one running time. Alternatively, you could at query time um, compute the answer to your query and do nothing at update time. You have a different algorithm, right? So you usually have this trade-off where you either do all the work at query time or all the work at update time. Um, and often what we want is a trade-off between the two. So we would like to have fast queries. Fast usually means polylogarithmic query time uh, and then updates as fast as possible. But there have been also some interesting trade-offs shown where you know, the query time was also pretty high and then you got very good update time. Now you might say, what if, how can you get a polylogarithmic update uh, output query time if the output is larger than polylogarithmic? For example, if you ask me for the minimum spanning tree, um, how can you output that in polylogarithmic time if you, know, you will have to output n minus one edges? Well, in that cases, there are usually two solutions. Uh, either the queries only output the value of the solution and not the solution itself. So they might only output the value of the minimum spanning tree and not the minimum spanning tree itself. Or uh, in cases where uh, the changes to the solution are only small, polylogarithmic after an update, each update could just output the changes to the solution. So except, for example, in the case of a minimum spanning tree, uh, you know that each update uh, in the graph can lead only to a constant number of changes in the minimum spanning tree, so you can output them after each update. And another performance criteria is, of course, the approximation ratio of the solution if you cannot afford to update the exact solution very fast. This is especially interesting for shortest paths, for example, or all kinds of problems where we have lower bounds for the problem. Yeah, so I need to introduce a little bit of notation. So I will always have a weighted graph, V the number of nodes, E the number of edges, W the edge weight, if there is one, N is the number of nodes, M the number of edges. I use uh, polylog N um, to denote log N to some constant C. And I use this notation O tilde F of N, which means O of F of N times polylog N. So omitting polylogarithmic factors in N. Good. So now we're done with all the definitions, or at least the main part of the definitions, and let's go on to the motivations. Why do we care about dynamic algorithms? Well, I said already that there are large dynamic graphs in real life. But a second motivation, and this was actually what motivated me originally to work on this topic, is that this is a basic computational question. How hard is it to find the answer to a problem after you change the input a little bit? 
is it really necessary to look at the whole input again, or can you do it much more efficiently? So it's just a fundamental complexity question. And thirdly, actually dynamic algorithms have been used, especially recently, as subroutines to get faster static algorithms. Uh, so the new, for example, almost linear time algorithm for maximum flow and minimum cost flow does use a dynamic graph data structure internally to get the desired speed up, among other interesting ideas, of course. Okay, so that's the third motivation. Now let me tell you about what is the state of the art in dynamic graph algorithms in the theory world. Uh, the state of the art in the experimental evaluation I will mention in the experimental section. Well, so here I just listed classic problems in undirected graphs. And you can see already there's a bunch of results. Uh, this has been an active field and a bunch of things are already well understood. So for example, for connectivity, uh, there's a cell probe lower bound of log n and there's an upper bound of polylogarithmic. So currently I think it's log n times log log n squared. Uh, same for MSD, except that this bound here is log n to the fourth divided by log log n. Um, for single source source path, there is a conditional lower bound for the exact setting of m to the one minus epsilon. I'll talk about them in a second, conditional lower bounds. And uh, there's a trivial Dijkstra algorithm, which gives you O tilde of m. For all pair shortest paths, the same lower bound, but there's an upper bound algorithm, very clever and still the best uh, by Dimitrescu and Italiano, which is O tilde n squared. For minimum cut, we have again a conditional lower bound, but just for the weighted exact setting, not for the unweighted exact setting. And there's an approximation algorithm, uh, which takes uh, tilde square root n. And for ST max flow, there's a lower bound, m to the one minus epsilon for weighted exact and uh, um, O tilde m upper bound. And uh, for maximum cardinality matching, there's a lower bound, which is just m to the one half minus epsilon and an upper bound of order m. So you can see there's still some interesting gaps here, for example, for maximum cardinality matching. There's actually, so ever since these conditional lower bounds have shown up and have shown that many problems are hard, for example, all pair shortest path is hard, people have started to also work on approximate versions. Um, I have a, there's a whole bunch of work on approximate al 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 dynamic algorithms, but I don't even want to get into this. And we actually wrote a survey um, Katrin Hanauer and Christian Schulz and myself wrote a survey on dynamic graph algorithms. You can find it on archive. I will also give a link to it at the end of this talk. And there we talk about all these things. Okay. And we also talk about the uh, algorithms engineering work, not just the theoretical work. Okay, now let me tell you about the conditional lower bound. That has been very exciting work uh, about you know uh, almost 10 years ago. Um, it was started initially by Patrascu, and then there was this breakthrough paper by Abud and Vasilevska Williams. And then we had some follow up work with Kriniger, Nanongai, and Saranurak. And the idea is to use some common complexity assumptions and show that they imply lower bounds for dynamic graph algorithms. So if you came up with a faster dynamic graph algorithm, you would actually show that a common complexity assumption is not true. Um, so depending on whether you like them or not, uh, you might not try to get this running time then because it's probably a bit unlikely that you will get this. So, and this was really a, break, a big breakthrough because we were always thinking, why can we not get a sublinear time single source shortest path algorithm in the dynamic setting? And now there is a conditional lower bound telling you this is probably not gonna happen. So this was really a lot of progress in the field. I will not go into details how they work because I want to spend my time also talking about the experimental work. I want to, however, briefly mention that there are also other dynamic models. For example, for the insertions only setting, the incremental setting or the deletions only setting, there has been tons of work, okay? And I can't even start mentioning them. And also in our survey, we don't talk about them because you could write books about this work. Then there is a subgraph model where you actually give them a fixed graph at the beginning and think of nodes as being light bulbs that are switched on and off. And at each point in time, you only look at the subgraph that's induced by the light bulbs that are on. There's this F sensitivity model, um, there are kinetic data structures, and finally dynamic data streams. They're all related but different. 
Okay, now let me talk about uh, upper bound techniques that actually get you this polylogarithmic time per operation. There are two more general techniques, and I want to mention them. Even so, for some special cases of problems, there are also other you know, algorithms that don't use these techniques and achieve polylogarithmic time. But since these are more general techniques, I want to explain them. So the first one are hierarchical graph decompositions. Um, so here, what you should think of is the graph is decomposed into log and other log and levels. And depending on the exact problem that you're trying to solve, it's either the nodes that are partitioned or the edges that are partitioned into the levels. And um, then you get a sequence of updates. And the exact partitioning depends actually on the sequence of updates and also on what invariance you want to maintain. So the first type of hierarchical graph decompositions I call monotone hierarchies with global invariance. Monotone because all edges are inserted at the bottom level and they can only move up in the hierarchy. And they maintain, however, some global invariant of the gra whole graph. I'll give you an example in a second. And they can lead to deterministic algorithms and also randomized ones. But usually we care about deterministic ones are better. Um, so they have been used for uh, to achieve polylogarithmic time algorithms for connectivity, minimum spanning tree, two edge connectivity, and two vertex connectivity, and also very recently uh, for expander for maintaining an expander decomposition. I'll give you the example here for spanning trees. How does that work? Um, so nodes are here on all levels, and each edge is just on a unique level. And whenever an edge is inserted, or also at the beginning of the algorithm, all edges are on level zero. And now the algorithm maintains a spanning forest T of the graph. And let G larger or equal than I denote the graph of all edges on level I and above. And now what the algorithm does, it maintains these two global invariants. One invariant says, if you look at the edges of T that are in, on level I and above, then they also form a spanning tree of the graph on level I and above. So T is not, a span, not only a spanning tree of the whole graph, it's also a spanning tree if you just look at it on level I and above. That's the level invariant. And the second invariant is a size invariant. It says that the number of nodes in a connected component on level I is at most order n divided by two to the i. And that then guarantees that they only order log n levels. And now the work that you do, you can somehow charge to the edges on, on each level. The work that you do on a level, you charge to the edges on that level. And that is then used for the amortized analysis. But the, so the crucial thing is edges, this is monotone, edges only go up. And these are the global invariants. The second type of hierarchical graph decompositions is not monotone, um, and, but it has local invariance. It enforces local invariance. So it's not monotone, which means edges and nodes can move up and down. And the local invariant is some condition on the neighborhood of every node. I'll give you an example in a second. And it's directly enforced by the algorithm, and it usually just leads to the correctness of the algorithm. And then often you have to combine these hierarchies with a second technique or idea to get something useful out of it. For example, uh, get a delta plus one vertex coloring or something like this. Here I'll give you the example of an approximate fractional matching in the vertex cover. So what you do is every node here has a level uh, between level minus one to level L, which is log n. Okay, so every node sits on exactly one level and every edge has a weight and the weight of the edge depends on the higher endpoint, where the higher endpoint sits. That determines the weight of the edge. And now the, each node has a weight, which is just the sum of the weight of the incident edges. And now the local invariant that you have to maintain are these invariants. So for nodes that are on level from zero up to log n, their weight has to fall into this range. And then for a node on the bottom level, it has to fall, its weight has to fall into this range. So it's a local invariant because it's just enforced on the edges incident to a node. And it actually implements a relaxed complementary slackness condition for the matching LP and then immediately leads to a two plus epsilon vertex cover, a dynamic vertex cover algorithm. Okay, but so what's the interesting thing here? The interesting thing is that uh, you get a relative, due to the local, this approach works for local algorithms. So algorithms where the correctness depends on just the neighborhood of a node. And it then as the algorithm directly enforces that this condition holds for every node, 
you get a very simple correctness proof. The running time analysis actually uses usually a carefully chosen potential function. And you can get either deterministic or randomized algorithms out of that, depending on the problem. And it's used uh, to get polylogarithmic or even constant time algorithms for uh, approximate vertex cover and fractional matching, for approximate set cover, approximate densest subgraph, and delta plus one vertex coloring. However, I should add that for approximate densest subgraph, uh, there's a better algorithm known by now that does not use our technique. Um, so we only got a, a two plus epsilon approximation, and there is a one plus epsilon approximation that is not based on, on this technique. It is, and it also takes polylogarithmic time. Okay, so these were the hierarchical decompositions. And now there's a completely different approach based on random ranks that has been recently developed, and that is also very promising. Um, so why did we have these hierarchies at all? Basically, the hierarchies are used for each node to say, to give some kind of order on the nodes. There are the nodes, the neighbors that are below and the neighbors that are above. So every node can now order the neighborhood into the below neighbors and the above neighbors. Now there's a, a, a different simpler way of doing this. You could just give every node a random number between zero and one, yeah? And so a random rank, and then you can just order the nodes according to the random ranks. And that gives you immediately also an ordering of all the nodes. And this ordering will not change throughout the algorithm. So you don't need to spend any time maintaining it because it doesn't change. Now, again, you will maintain some local per node invariant. And uh, the idea is now, how will you use the rank? Whenever there is an update that happens at a node, um, you, will, you will do something that might violate the invariant at a neighbor, but you'll make sure that only neighbors with depending on the algorithm, smaller rank or larger rank, but only one type of rank will, will have their invariant invalidated. So this is how the algorithm makes progress. So if it has a node here at this rank and it has some, it needed to be updated because its invariant was broken, it's only allowed to break the invariant of let's say neighbors of lower rank and not of neighbors of with larger rank. And in expectation, it should at most should break the invariant of at most one neighbor and this is the way you make progress because, okay, so you might have another neighbor of lower rank whose invariant is broken and then it fixes its invariant and it might have someone else, another neighbor whose invariant gets broken. But you kind of form a path of invariants that are broken, but you, you show that this makes enough progress and you get a good running time. So here the analysis is actually quite sophisticated. It needs a potential function and a probabilistic analysis, and, uh, but it leads to pretty nice algorithms. Uh, it gets very good. Uh, the first polylogarithmic algorithms for maximal independent set were found in this way. Always an algorithm for maximal matching, but there's a different approach using a hierarchy actually that gets a better running time for maximal matching. Um, we also used it for a constant time algorithm for delta plus one vertex coloring. So in the delta plus one vertex coloring problem, the maximum degree in the node is delta and you have delta plus one colors and you need to color every node such that uh, every node has a color that's different from all its neighbors. And of course, with delta plus one colors, since you have at most delta neighbors, this is always possible. So this is a beautiful technique. And as I will show you, it works well in practice, but it has one significant drawback. And this is, it only works against an oblivious adversary. Why? Well, um, if the adversary manages to figure out the ranks of the nodes, it, com it can completely destroy the running time analysis. And since you never change the ranks of the road nodes, um, it can completely destroy your analysis. Okay, so this is not deterministic and it only works against an oblivious adversary. Okay, good. So this is what I wanted to tell you about the theoretical work. Now let me tell you about the experimental work that has been done in that field. Well, I would group the experimental Pro, the problems into three types. So there are these problems where there have been experiments that use the theoretical best algorithm and expanded it. Usually the theoretical best algorithm doesn't just work by itself. It expanded it and then it compared it with a static algorithm or some heuristics and, you know, dependent on the inputs, graphs, and uh, sometimes the theoretical best and the problem, sometimes the theoretical best is best, sometimes the heuristics are best. And this is like work that has been done for connectivity, depth first search, minimum spanning tree, 
bridgeability matching shortest paths. There has been tons of beautiful work on shortest paths. Delta plus one vertex coloring, maximum flow, minimum cut. And I should also say uh, try accounting. That has also been done. Uh, with the shortest path, if you look in our survey, the work on shortest path is like the longest. There has been really tons of beautiful work with nice ideas. And you could give a whole talk or write a book about it by yourself. So I will not get into this, but it's a very good work here. Then there are these topics where actually only heuristics have been implemented. Either the, there were no theoretically good algorithms or um, they have not been tested. And this is the case for topological ordering, k core decomposition. Here, triangle counting, that's not true. There has been work, but subgraph counting for more complicated subgraphs. There has been some work by uh, Julian Schoen on click counting, for example, and um, also um, some work on, I think, cycle counting. Okay, but general subgraph counting has not been done. There has also not been done work on graph clustering and partitioning, and also not much on centrality measures. Basically, there have been theory, uh, heuristics implemented, but no interesting theoretical work has been done here, or it has not been implemented. And on the other side, there are some problems where so far there was no experimental evaluation, uh, but there was some theory work, for example, diameter or some approximation algorithms, for example, this approximate density subgraph problem that I mentioned before. So now let me try to convince you that it's really important to do experimental evaluation. Um, so why is this? What are the advantages? Well, the first advantage is, of course, obvious. Constants are ignored in the asymptotic analysis, but they can greatly influence the practical performance. Yes, we all know that but it can be a real disaster. And sometimes it's good for us to see again that this is a real problem. So for example, for dynamic reachability, well, there is a conditional lower bound. You cannot do it better uh, than linear time, fine. Um, but now let's evaluate different linear time algorithms. Um, so what we did is we made a naive uh, depth first search, breadth first search algorithm, of course, but we also took like a simple insertions only algorithm and made it fully dynamic. That's the red and the purple algorithms here. And uh, we also took a deletions only algorithm, namely the Evans Lohr uh, algorithm, the green and the blue ones here. We took two variants, added insertions to them. So they were all algorithms that have linear asymptotic running time. Um, but one was an incremental algorithm that we made that we added deletions to, and the other one was a deletions algorithm that we added insertions to. And the other one were the static algorithms. Well, the static algorithms were miserable, so we don't even have them in our plots. Um, but here, now, it was interesting to see how would these different types of algorithms perform. And here, I we did uh, evaluation on random graphs, but also on real life graphs. Here, I show you the data for the random graphs, because these were the largest graphs uh, that we were able to evaluate. Um, so what do you see? Here it says mean total insertion time. So what does uh, it mean? Or what does it show? Well, for the algorithms that were actually insertions, only algorithms to which we added deletions, even though this was a sequence that contained insertions and deletions, um, if we just looked at the insertions time, they were best here. While the deletions only algorithms that we made sort of ad hoc added insertions to it, to them, uh, they performed poorer. On the other side, if you look at the mean total deletion time, mean is because we averaged it over a bunch of graphs. Okay, so if you look at the total deletion time, then you see that uh, the deletions only algorithms perform better. Even so, this one variant here of the insertions only algorithm that we had talk made fully dynamic performed also okay. Okay, I would say. What's interesting to notice here is so here on the x axis, we have the density, meaning we kept the number of nodes the same and we made the graphs denser and denser. Okay, so this year density was 10. So there were 10 times as many edges as there are nodes. So you might wonder why does the running time actually go down as the density goes up? Well, the reason is these are reachability algorithms and uh, you only need to really do work. So both of these all of these four algorithms actually maintain a reachability tree from a single source, a reachability tree. And so only, for example, for a deletion, if an edge of the reachability tree was deleted, did you have to do any work? And as there are more edges, it is less, and we had here random insertions and deletions, right? It became less and less likely 
that an edge was deleted that was actually in the reachability tree. And thus, uh, for most deletions, now no work had to, had to be done as the density increased. And the same thing for insertions. If you inserted an edge to a node that was already reachable, there was nothing that had to be done. Okay, so that's why the denser the graphs, the less work you had to do and the faster the algorithms became. Okay, but then if you look at the running time here, actually the measure goes up to a thousand seconds. But if you look at the insertions time, the top here measure is 10 seconds. So the even though there was the same number of insertions and deletions, the insertions were actually much faster than the deletions. Okay, and thus, if you look at the overall running time, if you just add up these numbers here, it's of course dominated by the deletion time. Okay, but this shows again to you that even though this had the same asymptotic complexity, different constants made a huge difference. And the other thing that point, this points out to you is also that it depends on how many deletions you have and how many insertions, whether it's worth to do uh, which algorithm to run, right? So in practice, if you know that there will be mostly deletions, you might want to run the deletions based algorithms, the blue ones. If they're mostly insertions, you might want to run the red or the purple one. Okay, now the second reason, again, very well known why you want to do experimental evaluation is that the cache behavior is ignored in our RAM model and thus in all our asymptotic analysis. And this is a real problem. As we experienced, for example, by implementing this delta plus one vertex coloring algorithms. Um, you might have noticed before in the theoretical talk, I mentioned there was one such algorithm that takes constant time and was based on a graph hierarchy. And one such algorithm that takes amortized constant time, both I take amortized expected constant time. Um, one, the green one here, is based on random ranks. And now I wanted to know which of the two is faster, the hierarchy based one or the random rank one, then implemented. So we implemented them and it turned out, well, the green one is always 30% better than the blue one. Okay, the random rank is really better uh, on random graphs, but also on some real life graphs, they were green beat blue all the time. Okay, good. But then it turned out we also implemented some simple baselines. Uh, this red one is a baseline that maintains some data. I don't want to even get into it, but maintains some data structure. But the orange one was the most naive thing you can think of. If an edge was inserted between two nodes that had the same color, just pick a random one of these endpoints, pick a random color for it and give it this random color. And then you check all its neighbors. And if one of the neighbors has already this color, then recolor the neighbor. So you, you recurse on all the neighbors. Now in expectation, since you have delta plus one colors and at most delta neighbors, you would expect to only have to recolor at most one neighbor, okay? But in the worst case, you know, you could have you recolor neighbor and then it recolors a neighbor and it keeps on going and never terminates. Well, so in theory could be horrible, but it was our best algorithm. It's down here, okay? It was clearly our best algorithm. Why is this? It doesn't maintain any data structure, okay? And for all the other algorithms, they maintain the data structure and the data structure uh, Cause uh, maintaining the data structure cause additional work because when you change your color, you better tell all your neighbors and the other algorithms do even more work. Okay. And so they're jumping around in memory because you have to tell all the neighbors that they have changed their color. And this leads to low locality of the memory access pattern and leads to really poor behavior uh, on these random graphs. Of course, you can come up with some worst case sequences where they perform poorly. But for example, if you made the average degree, if almost every node had degree delta or delta minus one, then uh, these algorithms, the red and the orange one started to behave poorly. Okay, but still um, in graphs where this is not the case, uh, the orange and the red always beat the other two. Okay, now other advantages is of course that you can more easily do performances on different classes of graphs. For example, what people usually do is they look at sparse graphs or power law graphs. Well, for all pair shortest paths, they looked at this roadmap graph. So you can look at suitable graphs for your application once you have it implemented. And you can also easily add different types of updates. For example, weight change updates, vertex updates. That's much more easily, if you have it already implemented, you can usually easily do this. While in theory, you know, it usually requires a lot of work uh, to analyze different kinds of update operations. But for me, of course, the main argument why you should do experimental evaluation is that this is really convincing for, for engineers in industry. If you want people in industry to actually use your algorithms, you better implement them and show them how they perform 
on either artificial data or real life graphs, because then they can easily see, okay, is my setting similar to the setting that was tested? Which of these algorithms is actually the best? Otherwise, if you only give them the theory papers, they have to do all this work and not just the implementation, but also thinking about how to simplify them. Okay, so if you want your algorithms to actually have impact in practice, you have to experimentally evaluate them. Now, what are the challenges? Well, one challenge is where do you get the data? And the other question is, of course, what are the right experiments and measurements? So let me give you briefly some thoughts on that. Regarding the data, well, there are these places where there is static and dynamic networks are available there. You can look in our survey and find them there as well. There are also generators for clustered networks. And there are also various techniques on how to convert static graphs into dynamic sequences. Um, performance measurements. Well, one is, of course, how much speed up do you get over the static algorithm? But it turns out not that is so simple, not that is even so simple. So we developed a dynamic mean cut algorithm. And then we wanted to see how much speed up do we get. But then the question was, well, how many insertions and how many deletions should we do in our evaluation? And that made a huge difference. So here, all these different colors here are different trade-offs between insertions and deletions. So the blue dots are only insertions. And these little bars that you might see down here, these are only deletions. And so you see here, the speed up here is one and then 10 and so on. And you see for the bars, we were more down here. For the blue dots, we are up here. And for all kinds of trade-offs, we are in the middle. So how much of a speed up you get depends on the number of updates you do, but also the type of updates. Okay. And so maybe a useful measure, this kind of graph, I think is a very useful uh, graph to have. Or if you want to have a number, you might want to ask, what is the break-even update size? So how many updates do you need? And how large does the graph have to be for the dynamic algorithm to be better than the static algorithm? And another question you might want to ask is, how many insertions do you need versus how many deletions for your algorithm to be better? Remember the picture I showed you before about this reachability algorithm where you saw insertions, uh, these insertion only algorithms and deletions only algorithms and how they, depending on what your setting is, you might want to run the one or the other. Um, yeah, and then finally batches. So what is a batch? A batch is a set of updates that are performed jointly. So you're guaranteed that there are no queries while processing a batch. And why is this interesting? Well, first of all, in real life, updates are often handled in batches. And second of all, um, it's also a sort of a sign of um, how, how well your algorithm works. So if you make your algorithm that's actually designed to handle batch size one, work against a static algorithm that only has to do updates every, you know, can have batches of size 10 or larger. Then you can see how long can your dynamic algorithm that has batch size one compete with a static algorithm that has a larger batch size. That's an interesting measure as well. So for example, here uh, we looked at, we had some data set that naturally had actually batches. So the updates were given me batches. And so these are all different data graphs and different update sequences here. And now we group them by batch size. So there were some that had batch size like one, like what we I talked about so far. But then you also had some that had batch size about 10. There were usually 10 updates at once and some a hundred and some a thousand. And so we always looked at how much speed up does the dynamic algorithm get, I'm sorry, how much speed up does the dynamic algorithm get um, versus the static algorithm. And you can see as batch sizes get bigger, the speed up that we got became smaller, which is natural because the dynamic, because the static algorithm had to only run once per batch, but we had to do our work every time after each individual update. So I think this is also a useful um, graph to give because it shows when is it no longer worth to implement a dynamic algorithm? When should you just stick with your static algorithm? Okay, where to publish? Well, there are a bunch of conferences you can publish this kind of work. There's also a new conference called Symposium on Algorithmic Foundations of Dynamic Networks where you can publish this work. So let me summarize. So algorithms for dynamic graphs are becoming more and more important in theory as well as in practice. But if you wanna have practical impact then theory alone doesn't solve the problem. Uh, algorithms engineering is very important. Uh, it's an important contributor to actually find the fastest algorithm for practical solutions. 
And what is my uh, favorite future work? Well, first of all, there are these three interesting gaps between upper and lower bounds that are left for fundamental problems. One is for all pair shortest paths, for maximum cardinality matching, and for cyclic detection. Um, I would love to see either the upper bound move up, uh, move down, or the lower bound move up. Then, of course, uh, there's more work on empirical evaluation, as I mentioned before. And then what I've been recently looking at is uh, dynamic algorithms with additional properties. So interesting additional properties are, for example, uh, small space uh, algorithms. Uh, so just like the streaming algorithms, where you're not allowed space proportional to the number of edges, just to the number of nodes, or um, algorithms that are differentially private, that do not disclose which edges, for example, exist. Or one could also, of course, add um, parallel algorithms or algorithms that work well in the distributed setting, dynamic algorithms that work well in the distributed setting. Yeah, thank you very much. And here is, as promised, uh, the link to the survey that I mentioned during the talk. All right, thank you very much, Monica. It was a very nice talk. Do we have any questions from the audience? I have a hand from Satya. I'm going to allow them to ask their question. Yes, I hope you can hear me. We can. My, yes. Thank you. Not sure if you can see me, but uh, my voice should be clear. Um, so uh, one question I have is in the dynamic graphs. Recently, there has been some work that has been focusing on where updates happen concurrently. OK, like and they look into like so when I say concurrently, simultaneously updates happen on the same graph, like say in a multi-threaded setting, whereas there is a one thread that is doing an up, uh, adding a vertex, other thread that is deleting an edge and, and so on. So uh, just wanted to get the, uh, the speaker's view opinion on that side of research. Oh, I think that's also, yeah, 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 that's also relevant. Yes, definitely. So um, that's uh, not something that I've been working on. And none of these techniques that I had mentioned so far would work in that setting. But that just means it's a challenging new direction to go into. Yeah, um, just like like parallel and distributed, which I should have put on my slides as well. Yeah, I think everything that brings us closer to practice is a good thing. Yeah, and concurrent is one of the directions there. Yes, I haven't worked on it, but I think it's great. Yes. Do we have any other questions? I think there are some in the Q&A box. Ah. ah, yeah. What is a good data structure used in industry for storing and updating the dynamic graph? For, ex for example, Stinger by Total Tech was developed for dynamic graph algorithms. Um, yes, so actually also in our survey we mentioned uh, what kind of systems that have been built for dynamic graphs. Um, but the point is, or the problem that I see with these systems is there's like not one, you know, one general system that you can build that will work for all kinds of different graph problems. Like that's one of the main characteristic of this field is that you need a special algorithm for all kinds of different uh, Gra dynamic graph problem. You need a very special algorithm. Otherwise, you're going to get something very, very rough. You know, something like, oh, yeah, start running your updates. And if you're not done after some time interval, then stop and recompute from scratch. This you can do. But apart from that, you know, there will be not one general technique that will help you speed up all kind of problems on dynamic graphs. So yes, in our survey, we do mention that there are different ways of storing dynamic graphs. But this is just for storing. That doesn't mean that they actually give you useful answers if you want to solve dynamic minimum spanning tree and dynamic shortest path and dynamic denser subgraph all at the same time. And I'm very, I am very pessimistic. I think such a you know thing will not exist. <laughs> and so you need to just you know uh, live uh, with that fact. And if you have a specific application in mind for which you need a dynamic graph algorithm, you need to implement this specific uh, data structure for it. Great, and we have one more question, which is, which of the techniques you discussed are most relevant for dynamic distributed graph algorithms? Um, so for distributed graph algorithms, 
Usually this is again a very different technique, uh, different techniques from the ones that I discussed here, because there you're trying to limit the communication. And the main challenge is there if the graph that you communicate on also changes, yeah, because usually this distributed graph algorithms um, on the network for, for they, they communicate on the same network for which they want to compute something. And now if this network changes while you're com communicating along it, you can get into all kinds of trouble, right? You uh, certain, so there, in, as a consequence, there are different uh, models that have been developed. And the main difference in these models is always um, how much time are your uh, communication, rounds of communication, are you allowed before the next change comes? So the simplest model is um, there's some change, you get to communicate, figure out a new answer, and then only will the next change arise. Another model is um, there are changes coming, you're communicating and communicating and trying to keep up. And then at some point the changes stop, and then you measure how many rounds do you need then until you have the right answer again. <laughs> and there are a vari variety of other models in between. And so as there are different models, and uh, the main focus is on communication, these techniques that I presented here uh, will not be useful. Um, or I, I would be surprised if they were useful. Yeah. They are very much tuned towards the centralized model where you want to be as fast as possible in, in the computation that you do. Um, maybe for parallel algorithms, these techniques are still useful that I mentioned here. Okay, But for the distributed setting where you worry about communication, I don't think they are very useful. Okay, thank you. We have one more question, uh, which is, do graph techniques work for other areas like dynamic algorithms and computational geometry? Yes, uh, so there has been actually some uh, uh, cross fertilization, I want to say. Um, the techniques that have been developed in computational geometry are useful for graph algorithms and vice versa. Mostly it's actually going this direction. Uh, because computational geometry has been studying dynamic setting for much longer than we've been studying graph algorithms, dynamic graph algorithms. So they have much more, many more tools and data structures. For example, uh, range query data structures can be used um, to solve some dynamic graph problems and so on. So yes, so there is some cross fertilization, um, but since the people in computational geometry are usually ahead of us <laughs> in this setting, or whatever, usually they are ahead of us in the dynamic setting, the import has been more in this one direction. There's also good cross-fertilization with data streams. So techniques from data streams are sometimes useful here and vice versa. Okay, and I think we have time for one more. Someone asked if you could suggest additional resources to follow if they were interested in working in dynamic graphs. Ah, okay. Yeah, so, so the reason why we wrote the survey is because there are not many resources. So there was a resource written, but it's already over 10 years old. And this field has really almost exploded in the last 10 years, okay? So there was a, a survey also written by Italiano, not also written by Italiano. And then there was also this uh, handbook of uh, data structures. And there are also some short articles about different kinds of dynamic data structures in there. Um, but this is all the more older work. Uh, meaning older, more than 10 years or something like this, or eight years or something like this, okay? So there, there has, this, uh, these resources exist, um, but the newer work is not in there. And there's also no textbook on dynamic algorithms. And um, especially the insertions, uh, so we, in our survey, we only talk about the fully dynamic, meaning insertions and deletions, yeah? We are ignoring everything else, and there's tons of work outside too. And the, I don't know of a good, survey for insertions only or deletions only algorithms. So one really needs to, you know, search the web for these papers, or go to Google Scholar or something like this and look for the papers, yeah. Right, but you mentioned that there's a new conference, the SAND yes. conference. Which yes, is there's a new area. conference and I wanna encourage everyone to publish there. Um, I was there actually this year and um, yeah, I found it very good. There's also some people who use uh, some kind of more uh, distributed dynamic models actually are there, like uh, po po uh, population protocols, for example. And um, yeah, and I felt like um, these kind of dynamic graph algorithms, the way I study them are not well represented yet. So we should, we should be going more because these people are very open. They want us to come and actually, you know, interact with us and, and learn from us. So mostly these are distributed algorithms people right now 
but uh, we should go there and interact more and learn from each other. All right. Thank you very much. I would be remiss if I did not mention uh, that the ACDA conference also welcomes work on dynamic oh. networks. Yes. And I have heard that the conference has been confirmed for 2023, will be occurring in Seattle uh, at the end of May. So you can look for an official announcement and a, subsequently a call for papers in the next little bit. Very good. <laughs> right. Thank well, you. Thank you again, Monica, for joining us. Thanks to everyone who logged in for the talk. And we hope to see you at the next installment of the seminar series, which will likely be held in fall of 22. Look for an announcement on SIAM Engage and also on Twitter.